Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us here at Kennedy Space Center. I'm NASA Press Secretary Jackie McGinnis, and we're joined today uh, for an Artemis update by NASA leadership and our Artemis II crew. They just got a first look at the spacecraft that will take them to the moon. And unfortunately, we only have 45 minutes today for this briefing, so we'll try and keep it short. Joining us, we have NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy, Associate Administrator Bob Cabana, Associate Administrator for the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, Jim Free, Artemis II Commander, Reed Wiseman, Pilot Victor Glover, Mission Specialist, Christina Cook, and Mission Specialist, Jeremy Hansen. First, I'll hand it over to the Administrator for a quick update. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, the fact that the crew has seen their spacecraft now, uh, this is another major step of us going back to the moon. Remember, uh, we're going back to the moon. It's actually a different moon. We're going to the South Pole. Uh, we're going to see um, several spacecraft, uh, some, too, perhaps, from other nations that are going to be landing on the South Pole in the near future, perhaps this year. So there's a renewed interest in the moon. And, of course, it's, it's there because the potential of water. And if there is water in enough uh, abundance, then you have the potential for hydrogen and oxygen, which would fit in very nicely with why we're going back to the moon this time after a half century. We're going back to learn to live in a deep space environment for long periods of time so that we can go to Mars and return safely. Uh, now, along the way, there are going to be several scientific uh, excitements, uh, the development of new tools, the development of, of new implements, the, the development of new procedures, all of which it's in this moon to Mars program, and that's the goal. We're going to venture out into the cosmos. We go back to the moon this time in a different way. We go back with commercial partners, and we go back to the moon with international partners. Uh, you should have seen the reaction when uh, Reed brought the crew to Ottawa uh, and they were in front of the parliament. Or you should have seen uh, Jeremy in his 10-gallon hat at the largest rodeo in the world in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, there's an excitement there that I can tell you that's quite exceptional as an international mission. You should see the fact that moi, having just returned from South America, three uh, countries, uh, Brazil, Argentina, and uh, Colombia, no hesitation about the president of those countries receiving our NASA delegation and not only excitement, but enthusiasm of presidents that amazed our U.S. State Department uh, embassy staffs that would accompany us. Uh, there is this excitement in the international community. And of course, all along in the science that we're going to discover things just like I say about the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, we're going to answer questions that we don't even know what the questions are right now. But I remember back uh, on the 60th anniversary, they had uh, me go to Houston 60 years to the day, and Rice University was having this celebration. Uh, and it was in the same place that President Kennedy uh, spoke 
to an audience in that Rice Stadium. This was, uh, you know, a long time ago. But he said he had already declared in a, in a speech to the joint session of Congress about a year earlier. In the meantime, John Glenn had flown. So we knew we were on our way. And Kennedy went there and he said, we go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And space is hard. And there are those discoveries in overcoming this very hard environment that are going to fill us and our nature as discoverers and as adventurers. And that's why we're going back to the moon and then on to Mars. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, sir. And now Deputy Administrator Mari. Is it on? OK, great. Uh, it is really a thrill for Bill, Bob, and I to be here with the Artemis II crew to see their heart flight hardware. I think it um, brings back happy memories for the three of us of seeing our flight hardware, but also a shiver down our spine as we step forward into the next chapter of our destiny in human spaceflight. So we are going to stay, as the administrator said, that's very important, and we have the hardware, not just for Artemis II, but for flights all the way out through Artemis VI already in work. And that's, that's very significant. We've been spending a lot of time the last couple of years to really focus on what are the objectives that we need to prove on the moon? What exactly do we need to learn before we're ready to go to Mars? And this is a crucial first step along that way. One of our North Stars is science. That's why we explore to learn more about the universe, our solar system, our Earth, our, ourselves. And there will be some exciting uh, experiments on Artemis II, mostly focused on radiation and crew, because we now have the opportunity to have a crew that we have to have to advance this particular kind of science. But I do want to say for a moment, personally, as a test uh, pilot, how important this mission is at, for test flight. All the things that we want to do with this vehicle, we have to understand that vehicle and its capabilities and push its envelope in order to achieve all the things that we hope to do with it in the future. So that is the critical focus of this mission, is to do that test flight, to push the boundaries, to learn about this vehicle and its capabilities so that we can continue to do amazing things on the surface of the moon and then eventually on Mars. And this is the beginning of that cadence and we're excited to be here today to see us off on that first chapter. Well, I just wanna say that it's always great to come home to uh, Florida and KSC. This is where the action actually is and not uh, up in Washington, although it's a different kind of action up there. And it's, it's great to see the crew. It's great to be part of this leadership team. This is our crew up at NASA headquarters, and I, I can't think of a finer team to be a part of than with these two. Uh, this crew down here, there's something special. Uh, they are really great people, very accomplished. And seeing them see the spacecraft, you know, I know when they saw it, it makes it real. They know that they've got a mission that's coming up. You know, I think back to when we were seeing the modules of the International Space Station when they were just in an aluminum shell and watching them come together and be completed. We knew we were going to have a mission when we got to go up and assemble the space station. It really makes it real. And they got something to look forward to, and I envy them. I know these guys really well, and I'm very concerned about their health and safety. And I want you to know that as we move forward, going to the moon, going to the South Pole, safety is going to be paramount. It's not without risk, but we're gonna do our very best to understand all the issues, the risks, to mitigate them as best we possibly can to ensure the safety of this crew. And that, that means a lot. And I want you to know, having lived through Challenger as a young astronaut candidate and through Columbia in a senior leadership position, we're gonna do our absolute very best to ensure that when they strap in, we have done all that we possibly can to ensure their safety. We're learning a lot from the first Artemis test flight, Artemis 1, 
and that's going to help prepare us for Artemis II. And uh, Jim Free, my good friend who's leading this exploration effort for us, will share more about that. It's great to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to uh, to be here. I, I guess I'm my own crew here because there's a crew there and a crew <laughs> there. Uh, no, it's <laughs> uh, it's really great to uh, to share with you where we are with the hardware. Um, we recently, towards the end of July, completed our post-flight assessment review from Artemis One. Uh, that's where we go through all the mission objectives, look at open items and anomalies, and try and decide if we're on the right path uh, for uh, Artemis Two. We looked at uh, a number of things that have been open, the heat shield, uh, an electronics box on the service module, and uh, some of the release and retention bolts, uh, probably the highlight things. I think we have plans forward with all of those. We, we still have to get to, to, to root cause before we get to flight rationale. So to Bob's point about safety, uh, that's one of the things we need, uh, we need to get through. Um, as far as overall, we're still working towards the end of November for uh, 2024 for Artemis uh, two. That's uh, critical to stay on that path. It's this balance of pushing hard but maintaining the right philosophy of not pushing too hard, if that makes sense to you. Uh, but uh, I think to us up here it does because we still need to, to press and get our missions on a, on a cadence where we're doing the exploration around the moon and on the surface. This is a great first step for us, um, but we do need to be vigilant and, uh, and care about the people. Uh, going on these missions. Uh, we do have a number of uh, weeks of risk to that date. Uh, the crew module is the uh, critical path right now. We have to uh, get the crew module assembled and tested and then mated with the service module, then turn it over to the ground system folks here uh, for processing. Uh, the exploration ground systems team here uh, continues to push towards a mid-November roll of the mobile launch uh, tower out to the pad to do some verification and validation tests of all the systems that have been upgraded um, and repaired since Artemis 1. Um, and they're, they're on a good path to the 16th. They completed a couple weeks ago the repair of the cable that holds up the uh, crew access arm. Um, so that was a big, uh, uh, a big change. We were originally going to roll out on the 1st, but that was a, uh, one re uh, repair, repair we had to make. Um, Orion, I talked about the crew module already. Um, I'm sure it was great to see inside that for, uh, for the crew. Uh, the service module was handed over from our European uh, service, uh, uh, service module partners in the European Space Agency in, in June. Uh, we're con continuing to work on the heat shield. We'll probably uh, look for final disposition of that uh, early, uh, early next year. Uh, the space launch system, all the hardware is here right now except the core stage. Uh, we're holding the core stage back in, uh, in Louisiana for some, uh, uh, some repairs that we need to, to make to one of the downcomers, and uh, that'll probably be shipped in the November time frame. There's no impact to the uh, overall critical path or anything for, uh, for stacking, which will probably start in the February time frame of next year. Uh, from a flight ops perspective, obviously the crew training is, uh, is, is well underway. The landing and recovery team, which is part of the ground system group here at Kennedy, uh, did the underway recovery test uh, number 10 last week, which included a night recovery. And I know the crew got to see uh, the team in San Diego before they, they uh, put to sea. Um, you know, I, we're, we're really not working major issues right now. We have some of the dispositions I talked about. But I think we're on a, a good path, and I, I want to stress that vigilance piece. Um, I tell everybody, and I think I sat here at this table and said Artemis One was a great mission. We learned so much from it. The success was incredible. The only thing that carries over from that mission is the engineering. Uh, we're using all new hardware, so that vigilance of putting that hardware together and calling out when things are not right or there's a concern is really important because these four folks uh, next to me here depend on us to do that. So that will be a focus of the team and look forward to talking to you as we head closer to Artemis too. Reed? Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we made it to Kennedy. This is awesome. Uh, I'll speak on behalf of Victor, Christina, and Jeremy, and then we'll get into some questions. But uh, we're fired up. It's, it's a great day yesterday when you walk around the corner at the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Facility, and there's your spacecraft that you're going to ride in. Uh, the ship, as they call it, over there. And uh, we, got, we got to look inside and hang out, and it was really quite fascinating. Uh, we've been busy since April 3rd. It, it kind of started... Uh, with a, a bit of a media blitz, but then we got down to work. We've been studying spacecraft systems at the Johnson Space Center, 
Um, we have gone out to Denver to visit with the Lockheed facilities out there and meet the engineers that are working on the vehicle uh, from the software controls and displays. Uh, as Jim said, we were out in San Diego working with uh, our beloved United States Navy uh, and the rescue and recovery forces there working alongside NASA. Um, and now here we are uh, for our first visit as a crew to Kennedy Space Center. Uh, I think I want to touch on just two quick things. Uh, first, we get asked often what the measure of success for Artemis II is. And to the four of us sitting here, the measure of success for Artemis II is seeing our colleagues on the lunar surface, seeing our colleagues assembling Gateway, and then seeing people that are following in our footsteps, walking on Mars and coming back to planet Earth. Like that is the measure of success for us. Uh, Artemis II is the tiniest footnote in the Artemis campaign, and that is really what we believe. And, and every day that we go to work, we're, we're looking at this vehicle for the future. We're not looking at this vehicle for Artemis II, and that means a lot to us. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, because it's really struck us, is we, we hear about the hardware, and, and it's real. You, most of you saw it this afternoon with the spacecraft. Um, those that have been to Michoud have seen the booster. Uh, you know, out in Utah, our, our solid rocket booster segments are getting ready to be shipped down here for stacking. But as we go around and see the hardware, the thing that blows us away is the quality and the youthfulness of the people that are working on this program, these Americans, these Europeans, our Canadian allies to the north, when you get in these small rooms of 15 to 20 people and you see not only how hard they're working, but how motivated they are, how excited they are to be a part of this every single day, I wish every American, every Canadian, every European, everyone that's a part of Artemis, I wish they could just go see what we get to see, the quality of these people, it is totally awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Reed. And now we'll take your questions. For those of you joining us on the phone, you can press star one to join the queue. And for those of you in the room, if you could wait for the mic to reach you. Uh, first, we have a question with Marsha Dunn with the AP. Um, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Um, maybe for Mr. Free or I don't know. Um, what, what's your working target date for Artemis III? Is it still late 25? And for Artemis II, is there any thought being given to upgrading to a real orbital flight? And, and if not, why not? And maybe you could tell me if that adds so much more complication that you wouldn't even want to try it, Reed. I don't know. But that's, those are my questions. Yeah, so for Artemis III, um, we're still working to our contractual dates with everyone, which is the December of 25. Uh, we did receive a up, updated schedule from SpaceX that we're uh, we're looking to uh, get some more detail on. We were at Starbase uh, a couple weeks ago and really spent some time going through their major milestones uh, to uh, the Artemis III mission, which includes a prop transfer mission, as well as the uncrewed demo. Um, so really kind of sharing our philosophy, their philosophy, where they are with the hardware, trying to understand their schedule some more. So I think we're, we're, we'll look at that and update around that in the in the near future after we have some time to digest it. But what we're holding all the contractors to is that December of 25 date. Um, we may end up, you know, flying a different mission if that's the case. You know, if, if we have these big slips out, we've looked at can we can we do other missions if the if the possibility exists there. But, uh, but right now we're still trying to look at their schedule. The spacesuits are head into PDR in October. Um, so that's obviously the, another piece of hardware that is uh, on, the, on the, path, the critical path to, uh, to that mission. As far as um, uh, why not do an orbital mission, you know, I think this mission was designed with safety in mind. So we're gonna spend that 24 hours in Earth orbit. That, that was the first gate of, can we get all the systems checked out before we're committed to, to go to the moon? So that was the first aspect of safety. The second was, what can we do to make sure that we can get the crew home safely, even if we lose all the propulsion capability uh, for, on, the, on the Orion main engine? So we're gonna do that burn and, and do the lunar gravity turn so we don't have to take that risk. So everything about risk, even, uh, even the crew size. We try and focus on what, what's the right crew size for all the tasks that we have to do versus the risk that we put them at uh, to, to fly the mission. No. 
don't know if you want to address uh, it. The only thing I'll add is every day I go to work, Jeremy tells me that we're putting this thing into low lunar orbit, and I keep telling him, no, we are not, because we are doing the highly elliptic orbit using the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, and our TLI will be done on that European service module built by Airbus, and we're going to use our prop there. We're going to use it smartly. I look at this mission profile as three orbits of Earth, and I really like the way we build on it. Our first orbit is 1,200 nautical miles. We get that first 90-minute check out of spacecraft systems, and if there's something that our mission control teams in Houston don't like, we come home. And then we do that big, highly elliptic uh, burn, and we go out to 38,000 miles, which we're going to be glued to the window at the uh, apogee on that one. But that gives us our 24-hour return capability. And if everything's looking good, we do our TLI burn, which is also our deorbit burn, really. And, and, and then we do a few course corrections on the way out and the way back. So I really like the way safety is built into this, into this mission profile. And I don't think we're going into low lunar orbit on this one. <laughs> Thanks, all. Uh, Tom Costello with NBC. Here in the middle. Hi. Uh, well, congratulations on a, on a great day. Thanks for inviting us down here. Um, Senator Nelson, to you, uh, there is some discussion about the fact that America isn't the only one aiming for uh, the South Pole right now. Uh, potentially, you've got the Chinese also targeting the South Pole and maybe even uh, the Russians. Can you give us a sense of what is an, in play here in terms of the geostrategic issue and needing to get to the South Pole? And is this a competition? to see who gets there first and who would have access to that frozen ice, to the water. We're in a space race with China. Uh, you see the uh, actions of the Chinese government on Earth. Um, they go out and claim some international islands in the South China Sea, and then they claim them as theirs and build uh, military runways on them. It's called the Spratly Islands. So we want to make sure that the ideals of the Artemis Accords, which now have uh, 28 countries have signed, and there will be others that will be shortly following, uh, those ideals that we have the peaceful and cooperative uses of space together internationally. That's basically the framework of the Artemis Accords. So naturally, I don't want uh, China to get to the South Pole first with humans and then say, this is ours, stay out like they've done with the Spratly Islands. Uh, you look at uh, pictures of the South Pole, it's not like what you saw where Neil and Buzz were landing, constantly lit from the sun, uh, a few craters here and there. The South Pole of the Moon is pockmarked with deep craters and because of the angle of the sun coming in, most of those craters are in total darkness the entire time. So it lessens the amount of area that you can actually land on and utilize. And if indeed we find water in abundance there that could be utilized for future crews and spacecraft, uh, we want to make sure that that's available to all, not just to one that's claiming it. Now, you mentioned Russia. Uh, as a matter of fact, Russia has just launched a probe to land on the uh, South Pole. We wish them well. Uh, as you know, we've had a cooperative relationship with Russia ever since 1975 in Apollo Soyuz. We built the space station together. We operate it together. Uh, but I don't think that a lot of people at this point would say that Russia is actually ready to be landing uh, cosmonauts on the moon in the time frame that we're talking about. 
uh, going to the moon or that possibly China would be. Uh, and so I think the space race is really, uh, Tom, I think the space race is really between us and China. And we need to protect the interest of the international community for exactly the reasons I've laid out. Thank you, sir. Next question, Kristen Fisher with CNN here in the front. Thank you. Uh, Jim, my question is for you, and I just want to follow up on Marsha's question uh, about the timeline for Artemis III. Uh, back in June, you said that you were really concerned that SpaceX's Starship won't be ready in time and that it could push uh, the first launch attempt into 2026. And so I'm curious, after your trip to Starbase, has that level of concern grown, diminished? And if you can give us any insight into uh, what your conversations with SpaceX uh, are like right now. Uh, sure. So um, I, I don't. They they need to launch, as I said back in June. They need to launch multiple times, not just for us, but for them. And then they need to launch multiple times for us. So we we really want to see them find the success in their their uh, their launches, including the next one, which I know they had a booster fire uh, for the other day. Um, I, I think. My, my concern is the same because they haven't launched. And now our, our insight that we got from our visit there was tremendous. Um, we really spent, I think it was a 12 hour day, we got to see some of the hard, hardware, but most importantly, our teams had the chance to talk and go through the details of that cryogenic propellant transfer mission, the ship to ship transfer, which is the next big milestone in our relationship with them. It's a kickoff for one of our design reviews. Um, we got a better on we were able to convey for them the importance to us of talking about the whole picture the the administrator i think gave you the big the big picture we need to talk about what it takes to get those people on artemis 3 to the surface um, they're excellent at their their technical details and i think just continuing to grow our relationship beyond commercial crew in this area conveying why it's important for us to see that end-to-end -end schedule we have the other elements coming together. That's another concern for me. It's uh, uh, Starship doesn't exist by itself. There's interfaces for our suits. So our suits contractor has to understand the interface and, and the design and the, the emulators and simulators that are ready for that. Similarly for Orion, we need that interface to be worked. So I think we have a better understanding in the big picture, uh, our, our relationship, our needs. Um, but we, we know they're, they're gonna, they've proven that they can make great progress. I'm sure they will continue to do that. Um, but as I said to Marsha's question, we really are trying to get in the details of that schedule because when we come up with a date, December of 25 or whatever that date might be, we wanna have confidence for our teams that we all have a realistic path to get there. Thanks, Jim. Next, we'll take a question from the phones. We have Joey Roulette with Reuters. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, just to follow up on that last question for uh, Jim Free, you had mentioned SpaceX sent NASA an updated schedule. What did that schedule propose? Did it propose backing off of the December 2025 date and doing it sometime later? Um, based on what you've seen now, I, I know you're, you know, NASA still evaluating things. Uh, what do you think is a realistic date for that that mission, uh, based on what you know now? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Joey. I, I think my mom's probably watching this and she'll say, never did I think that Jim would get more questions than the astronauts on the panel. <laughs> um, um, you know, I think our, our teams are really trying to understand. I, I'm not going to give you a date, Joey, because our teams are trying to understand what are those trades. So we obviously have to go through a, a contract change when we, when we make this because we had a contractual date with uh, SpaceX. And we need to understand where the pressure points are that they have, where our needs are with some of the emulators, simulators, and interfaces that I talked about, um, and then decide what's the realism of that. We, we don't want to kind of zero margin schedule. We have to understand what the margin is in all of this. So in order to do that, our teams have to interact. That meeting at Starbase I, I talked about was, was one of many. Um, and then I think we'll come out in concert with the, uh, the leadership team of the agency and say, hey, here's where we think it's realistic what that date is. Thank you very much. Uh, next question here in the middle.
I, Philip Sloss, of course, for Mr. Free. Um, the, uh, you were talking about the uh, issues with, the, with Core Stage 2, uh, uh, Michoud. Um, when do you expect the stage to be ready for the engines to be installed? And if you have, I, know, I understand you still have a decent amount of margin in that schedule. What's the need date that you need the stage here at KSC? So with uh, with stacking happening in February, you know that if it's not here in February, that's where it'll start to impact their critical path. But um, the the Boeing team down in Michoud has a good handle on the work. Um, this is a different flow than the stage went through the last time because the stage the last time went down to Stennis and went vertical and had some traveled work with it there. Whereas this time we're we're doing all of that work at Michoud, so. Um, so it's a little bit different flow, and we don't want to push it down here and then have traveled work down here that um, that then brings the team from Michoud. We want them to do it. It's a little more challenging in Michoud because we have to rotate the vehicle, whereas if it's vertical, you can kind of get to all sides of it at one time. Uh, so it adds a little bit of time to it, but we feel like the, the best place to do that is Michoud, so we'll leave it there. But I don't expect it to go much past uh, November. This last little... Uh, issue we had on one of the downcomers was really um was really minor in the grand scheme of things um but I, yeah i don't see it pushing much past november thanks tim uh here on on the left uh, yeah. uh stephen clark our stetnica another one for jim free um you mentioned uh several re weeks of risk to the november 2024 date. Uh, do I take that to mean that you have several weeks of margin or several weeks of negative margin, so to speak, for that late November date? It's negative margin. Yeah. And uh, the, would you characterize the heat shield issue as sort of the, the largest unresolved um, uh, issue coming out of Artemis 1 at this point? And can you update us on what the root cause of that uneven charring and ablation of the heat shield was and any mitigations that uh, you're looking at for Artemis to either on the hardware or, or in the way you fly the reentry? Yeah, I think uh, I, I definitely want Reed and the crew to weigh in here. I think it's definitely the biggest open issue out of one. Um, we have, we're, we're going towards root cause and I think this goes to Bob's comment about safety and what the leadership team here has asked of us is focus on root cause. Um, we've been through two series of tests in the ArcJet out at Ames. Uh, the third series is happening this month. Um, we're, we have a, a, a fault tree that we've been working down. Uh, we have some theories on what the root cause might be. Uh, we, we won't talk about flight rationale until we get through root cause. Um, we just had this conversation. I don't want the, the team to think about flight rationale because as soon as you do that, you start to to jump past things that might be lurking as a root cause that you might miss. Um, so we, we have some ideas on, uh, on what that root cause might be, and these testing series are, are slowly buying that down. It's tests out at Ames. We've also done tests at Langley. We're doing some tests um, down at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in, uh, in Dayton. So we're using facilities across the country. I think we're on a path to that root cause with the final disposition in April, and of course that's got to come up uh, all the way through the agency. Our technical authority is a big part of that. The crew hears about it. I think they said they just heard about it yesterday, so they're heavily involved. Um, you know, obviously we're going to make the right decision to keep them safe. Um, if that decision is we we have to do something drastic, then we'll do that. But right now we're on a path to uh, to press to get to the root cause, and then we'll make the final determination from there. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Reed. Uh, I think you, you did a great job touching on it, Jim. And you know, every time you see me coming, you take a step back because I'm coming about heat shield. Uh, but we, we really have a, a lot of really strong trust in this team. Uh, we have some really talented researchers and, and engineers looking at the problem. And I know we will find the right solution. And for sure, this crew, we're not going to launch until we know we're ready, until our team knows that the vehicle's ready. Um, and we will keep the pressure on. But so far, I think all the right things are being done. Anybody else want to comment on it? Thank you both. Next, we have another question on the phone. Andrea Leinfelder with the Houston Chronicle. 
Hi, um, this question is for Jim. I was hoping you could give a little more detail on what you meant by saying we might fly a different mission. Like, are you suggesting that if the lander isn't ready in time, maybe you'll fly astronauts around the moon for a second time? Um, thank you. I think I think we're always we one of the things uh, Pam talked and I'm I'm not going to get her words right uh, so I won't even try but a few months ago about what we learned from ISS I think one thing we learned from ISS is to make sure we're flexible so we keep human spaceflight viable and uh, one of the things that ISS did was really look at the assembly sequence as hardware was available and it wasn't I think it's incumbent upon us to do that, that's what I was referring to, is we're, we're trying to look at all the missions we could fly to keep learning. We may, we may fly two and want to fly a different mission for three because we want to understand how the system works better. I don't want to look at it as a negative of, um, hey, we, we may not fly three the same way. For me, it's continuing to learn to do exactly what Reed said so that eventually we're putting humans on Mars. We're not going to accomplish everything in one mission. We shouldn't expect to. What we should do is expect to fly it safely and advance our cause of understanding to do our science, but cause of understanding of our vehicles and systems. Thanks, Jim. We have another question on the phone from Sarah Derry with Radio Canada. Sarah? Euh, la, le vaisseau Orion, comment ça s'est passé aujourd'hui? Peut-être un mot sur ça, s'il vous plaît. Well, pour moi, je vais dire quelques mots en français et en anglais, donc c'est compris ici aussi. Pour moi, c'était incroyable de voir la capsule uh, Orion pour la première fois. C'est la première fois que j'ai vu dedans la capsule et c'est magnifique. Et uh, it, it, uh, seeing la capsule pour tous nous, nous avons envoyé des chivers dans nos spines comme nous l'avons vu pour la première fois dans l'intérieur. Et une vraie flotte de hardware a fait une vraie impression. Et quelque chose qui a vraiment été stood out pour moi au cours des dernières quelques mois, comme nous avons été dans les systèmes, en profondeur dans les systèmes, c'est que je savais déjà que aller à la Lune était difficile. L'administrateur, vous avez parlé de ça. Kennedy talked about it. That's why we're doing it. I already knew it was hard, but boy, it's harder than I thought. As I start to start to look at all the systems and all the people trying to get to the, the solutions that we need to really get to the moon and get back and still be breathing when we land in the Pacific Ocean, it makes an impression. And, uh, and you know, when we're talking about timelines and stuff, you know, what's so obvious to all of us behind the scenes when we see it day to day is it's the success is not in the final solution. It's not in the touchdown or the launch date. The success is in the learning that's happening like right now. Like learning is happening right while we're sitting here and stuff that is going to serve us on our ultimate objective, which is to get to Mars. Here on the right, do you have to say? Yeah, J.D. Gallup with Florida Today, USA Today. Just, just a quick question. Uh, you talked about training and testing. What do you guys do to relax? What are you doing to kind of mentally prepare uh, for going on this mission? You go first, I'll follow up. So, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time doing this, spending time with you all, sharing the good news. Uh, so honestly, <laughs> When we're not doing this, that's a good time too. Uh, but no, it's, uh, we understand how important this is, and, and thank you for being here to, to share the story. But I have a family, you know, I'm a, I'm a husband and a father, and just the time that I get to spend with them, and uh, they understand how hard we're working to make this successful, and so just being able to be home and truly relax, that is a win in and of itself. So it's great to be here, but it's also going to be great to get back home. Yeah. And, you know, Victor brought up family, and I think one of the fun things that we do as a crew is get our families together. When we travel, oftentimes our families will come and they'll get to know each other, and that is really a great way to integrate. We feel like a family uh, in and of ourselves, and I think they are also feeling that way. But just taking time. Uh, last night, for example, on this trip, we found a restaurant, and the four of us went out to dinner together and had a great time, just, you know, camaraderie and uh, spending time together. So all the, all the normal things, just like we'll have those group meals in space um, in the Orion vehicle. Uh, we're doing it here on Earth to prepare for, for getting to know each other and all that trust and relationship building that's going to be needed for ultimately the successful mission that we're going to do together. And I'm hearing whispers or a question about which restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> we're government employees. You know yep. what I'm No <laughs> endorsement. <laughs> exactly. um, next question. Uh, Richard with the Orlando Sentinel. Hi, thanks, and this is for the astronauts. Sorry, Jim. Um, 
the last time Reed and I uh, were in the same room, we spoke. Um, we had Apollo astronaut telling us great stories. I'm wondering if, if each of you have had the opportunity to discuss with any of the pe people still with us who have already traveled to the moon, and if there's any inspirational stories that you might be able to share. Thank you. Uh, I almost missed a call from General Tom Stafford because I thought I was a telemarketer on the day that we were announced as a crew on April 3rd. Uh, and I did pick up the phone, and, and what really shocked me was how unbelievably excited he was that we are going back to the moon for the agency, for the nation, and for the planet. So that was my story. Yeah. And, uh, you know, someone who is very active in lunar science period and obviously the architecture that we're going to use to go back to exploring the moon and beyond is uh, Jack Schmidt. He's still around. He's still very active. And uh, to see his excitement and continued in enthusiasm about this project is great. And so he's always been around. But someone who I've had some really interesting conversations with about recently, and he didn't go to the moon but was an Apollo astronaut, Rusty Swikert. And our conversation centered around human nature and ancient wisdom. And I'm going to I'm going to save it for, for later because uh, I think he's going to have a chance to tell some more of this story. But the ancient wisdom part was a really, really uh, fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. We have time for one more question uh, here in the front. Uh, Yusuke Tomiyama, the Yomiuri Shinbun, Japanese Daily. Uh, my question is to Mr. Nelson. Uh, you mentioned the difference between the Apollo program and the Artemis program. One major difference is international cooperation. Uh, Japan secured the opportunity to both fly on the gateway in the Artemis program, but the opportunity to land on the moon has not uh, decided, so uncertain. What do you think about the opportunities for Japanese astronauts to land on the moon? This is a question that every country, uh, most every country in the world is asking. And uh, of course, the specific answer to your question will be decided years later. Uh, thus far, uh, those, that, uh, those countries that will be represented by an astronaut going to the gateway have participated uh, in the planning and will participate as part of the gateway, which is the mini uh, outpost or space station that will orbit the moon. Uh, the question about landing on the moon is to be determined. Uh, obviously, uh, it will be as a result of a participation in Japan's case, uh, Japan is very interested in doing a, uh, a compartmented uh, pressurized rover on the moon. That would certainly be a part of the consideration, uh, but other nations are doing the same kind of planning for the future as well. So uh, even though uh, we have a U.S. ambassador in Japan named Rahm Emanuel, who constantly is asking me on behalf of the Japanese government uh, these questions. Uh, nevertheless, that's going to be determined some period uh, in the future. All right. Thank you all so much. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. I know we had a lot of outstanding questions, so please feel free to reach out to us in the NASA newsroom. You can learn more about NASA's Artemis missions at nasa.gov slash artemis and i hope you have a great rest of your day thanks <laughs>